Hello everyone, greetings from the year 314, this is Daily here. Today I'm going to go through the, our story again, This Morning I Met a Whale. Um, I will also be going through the DT from this week's Home Learning PowerPoint and I'll hopefully be showing you some of the fantastic work that you sent through to us on Class Dojo. Okay, let's start with our DT this week from our Home Learning. So our current topic is the Rampaging Romans and that's involved looking at the Roman Empire and the impact that it had on Britain at the time and the legacy that it's left behind us. Our DT project on this week's Home Learning PowerPoint involves looking at Roman buildings and Roman architecture. The aim is that you'll become familiar with Roman architecture style and recognise some famous Roman buildings and remains. And then the main aim is hopefully that you'll be able to make a model of a Roman style building from a range of modelling materials that you can find at home. So using this web page, we can have a look at the various buildings that would have been found in a Roman town. The link is on the DT PowerPoint. The Romans built Britain's first towns. They built towns all over Britain as centres to administer the people who they had conquered. Within 17 years of the invasion, they had several major towns in place, and they were all connected by the famous Roman roads. Towns soon became very important places for both meeting and for trading. So what were Roman towns like? The Roman towns were full of fine buildings and temples. The Romans liked everything to be organised and orderly. Streets were often laid out in very neat straight lines, like on a chessboard. In the middle there was often a large square called a forum. It was used as a marketplace and for meetings, it was often very busy. It had shops and offices on the three sides, and usually the government side's offices were on the other side. Many towns also had running water and sewers. Aqueducts were bridges for bringing water into towns. Only the rich had water piped into their houses. Everyone else had to use water from public fountains. The only toilets were public lavatories, which were built around the town and connected to underground sewers. So what else could you find in most Roman towns? Well, most towns would have had shops as well as the Forum. At one end of the Forum was a large building called a Basilica. There were temples too where the Roman's god could be worshipped. Some towns had public baths, there were even open air theatres and huge monumental arches. What was the general layout of a Roman town? Well, throughout their empire, the Romans actually built towns near enough in exactly the same style. They were designed in like a grid formation, with streets built at right angles to each other, and often parallel with one of the two main roads. The streets of Roman towns were between 5 and 8 metres wide. Their width depended upon their importance. Each town had at least two main roads, one heading north to south and the other east to west. At the point where these two roads met, that would have been the town centre, where the administrative centre and the forum were usually found. The central part of the town contained the main businesses, with the homes and the dwellings where people lived of the citizens further towards the edges of the town. Now let's look at some famous Roman buildings. See if you can spot any similarities between the pictures of these. As you can see, the Romans were quite skillful builders. You will have probably noted the use of columns to support the heavy stone roofs and the triangular pediments above. Look at the decoration on those pediments and the tops of those columns. Why do you think the Romans used columns? Was it because of their appearance or were they grand, impressive and attractive? Maybe it was for other reasons like their strength. Let's look at a simpler picture of model of some of those Roman architecture building designs. So as you can see from this picture, the Roman columns are made up of the three sections. We've got the base at the bottom, the shaft which can have fluting on it, which give it a bit more decorations. Then we have the capital there at the top. And then this bit here at the top with the triangle bit, that is the pediment. So your task is to make a Roman style building using paper columns, cardboard roofs and pediments. And the next few slides will give you some tips and ideas that can hopefully help you achieve that. So you will need three or four cylinders, a large range of assorted cardboard packaging, those are the sort of things that you can find in your kitchen cupboards and around the house, large sheets of cards if you have any, some triangular pediments of different sizes, PVA glue or glue spreaders or even Pritt stick, uh, plenty of A4 or A5 paper for the columns, 
um, and then you could have acrylic paint or post paint if you want to try and paint them again at the end. Okay, so I'm using the PowerPoint to help me at the same time and we're going to have a go now at making a simple hollow cylinder from paper. Now it's surprisingly quite strong. So I'm going to demonstrate two different types you can do. So I've obviously got two different types of paper. Helps if you have sellotape at the ready or glue at the ready. There's two different ways you can roll it. So the quick and most effective way is to simply roll it. Now you can ask an adult at home to try and help you with this and then just simply add the sticky tape to make your cylinder like that. So that's one way of doing it. You can also roll your paper a different way. And it lengthways. And you'll get a different type of column. Now remember, however many columns that you decide to do, you need to try and make sure that you pick the same way. Because obviously if you were to try and get the pediment that you will have cut out, for example, this one here is no good because I've got two different types. But just like a scene from Art Attack, here's four I made earlier. So you might want to make a decorative capital for the top of your column and we can do that by cutting a strip of paper the same width as the paper you've used for each of your columns. Uh, you need to use a ruler to try and draw a line all the way down it, about two centimetres from one edge and then you can make parallel cuts and flaps uh, just like the photo above. I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this now myself. So I've drawn my two centimetres away from the edge and then I've also put some little marks along the top to try and show me where I need to try and make these parallel cuts. So all we have to do is snip up to that two centimetre line. I'm going to put gaps in between mine. So every time I cut one, I'm also then going to cut along the top like so. So you'll hopefully start to see, if I've done this one, that there'll be gaps in between the two. So I'm going to go all the way along, continuing to leave one and then cut one, leave one and then cut one. Okay, you can see now I have my sheet of paper with all the gaps in between. I'm now going to try and add the sort of curls that you'd expect to see at the top of a column on the capital. So with a pair of scissors, and you can keep them closed, where you start at the two centimetre line, you need to firmly, but carefully, so you don't rip your paper, run it along and it will create a nice little curl edge. And you just keep going all the way down the strip of paper curling those little flaps that you had created using a pair of scissors and your thumb and they will curl just like so and then you'll be able to with glue or stick tape pop it together and pop it onto one of your columns again seen from art attack here's one I made earlier and as you can see it's got that nice curled effect. Now there's nothing stopping you from doing another row underneath and attaching again and you could sort of create a layered effect to try and get those nice curls at the top of your column. Okay now I'm going to show you how you can support your pediments and um, because otherwise you've got your top part of the pediment. If we don't support it it tends to be flapping around a bit. So to do this you need to have a triangle to help hand it in place. So the one I'm using here is a right angled isosceles triangle with eight centimetre sides. What you need to do is with a ruler, draw two lines about two centimetres away from the side. So draw one like that. With a pair of scissors, we need to snip off this corner here, the outside corner. So we just snip it off, so it will end up looking something like that. Then what we need to do is we need to try and fold 
along these two lines. Now to do that and to help you, it's easier if you use a ruler. If you use a ruler like so along the outside line, it will then help you to make sure you keep the fold nice and straight. Like so. So then you do the other side. Like so. Now we need to get our triangle and we need to attach it to the base of our pediment. So we need to have one that looks like that and one that looks like that. And you can use glue or sellotape. At the minute I'm just using sellotape and I've got my sellotape at the ready. And I'm just going to stick it like so on the bottom and on the top one. You might need to have more than one piece just to make sure that it stays in place but then you will have a little triangle that will help support and keep your pediment more upright so it doesn't flap round and again this daily special here's one that i made earlier you will need two the final part that you need to do once you've added obviously all the decoration to your columns like the capsule i have at the top here so you've done all the same for all the columns that you've used is you simply then need to just attach your column to the pediment at the top and then you can add decoration to the pediments at the top if you want and then you can paint the whole thing if you desire but i think i've done quite a good job there i look forward to seeing all your temples and roman buildings uh, with this task and hopefully you enjoy the task just as much as i did let's continue now with our story this morning i met a whale an amazing story, Michael. The best I've read in a long time, and certainly the best you've ever written. Quite wonderful, she said. Only one thing I would say, Michael, she went on, is it doesn't really matter, of course, but if you do remember, Michael, I did say it had to be a true story about something that did really happen. It is true, miss, Michael told her. It all happened just like I said. Honest. That's when Jamie Bolshaw started sniggering and snorting. He spread all around the classroom until everyone was laughing out loud at him. It didn't stop until Mrs Ferguson shouted at everyone to be quiet. You do understand what true means, Michael, don't you? It means not made up. If it is true, as you say it is, that means that right now, just down the road, there's a bottlenose whale swimming about a river. And it means you actually did meet him and that you did actually talk to you. Yes, miss, he did miss, Michael said. And I did meet him this morning, early. Promise, about half past five or six, I'd say. And he did talk to me. I heard his voice and it was real. I wasn't making it up, but he's not there anymore, miss, because he's gone back out to sea, like I said. It's true, all of it, I promise you, miss. It was just like I wrote. And then, when Jamie Bolshaw started tittering again, Michael felt tears coming into his eyes. Try as he did, he couldn't hold them back, nor could he hold back the flood of words. He so wanted to make them believe him. It's true, miss, really true. When it was all over, I ran all the way back home, Mum was already having her breakfast. She told me I was late. <laughs> that I'd better hurry or I'd be late for school. I told her why I was late. I told her all about the whale, the whole thing. She just said it was a good story. But that she didn't have time for stories just now. And would I please sit down and eat my breakfast? I said it was all true, every word of it. I crossed my heart and hoped to die. But she didn't believe me. So I gave up in the end and just ate my breakfast like she said. And when I got to school, I didn't tell anyone else because I thought if mum didn't believe me, then no one else would. They'd just laugh at me or call me a liar. I thought it would be best to keep quiet about it. And that's what I would have done. But you said we had to write something that had actually happened to us. It could be funny or sad, exciting or frightening. Whatever we wanted, you said. But it had to be true. Really true. <laughs> no fantasy, no science fiction and none of the shock horror stories. Jamie Bolshaw, none of the blood dripping stuff. I want you to write down just what happened, children, just as you remember it. That's what you told us to do. And I couldn't think of anything else to write about except my whale story. So that's what I wrote about. It was very long, my the longest story, the most important story I've ever written. That's because I didn't want to leave anything out. I don't usually like writing stories. I'm not very good at them usually. Can't get started and I can't think of a good ending. But this time, it was like... The writing itself almost just doing itself. All I had to do was let it flow onto the page. Down from my head, along my arm, through my fingers. Sometimes though, it was really hard just to concentrate because I kept thinking about the whale 
hoping and hoping he was out in the open sea by now, with his family, again, safe again. The more I hoped, the more I believed, and the more I believed it, the more I wanted to tell his story. That's why I stayed in all through break time to get it finished. It was raining anyway, so I didn't really mind. When he finished, there was a long silence. Yeah, yeah, Jamie sneered. That'd be quite enough of that, Jamie, Mrs Ferguson snapped, clapping her hands for silence. She could see how upset Michael was becoming. All right, Michael, all right. Well, we'll say no more about it for the moment. Now, children, what I want you to do is illustrate the story you've just written, like the poem poster on the wall above the bookshelf, the tiger one over there. I read it to you last week. Do you remember? Tiger, tiger, burning bright. I told you, didn't I? <laughs> Mrs Ferguson put Jamie in the corner and Michael in the other. There hadn't been there five minutes before Mr Jenner, the head teacher, came in. Much to Michael's surprise and relief, he didn't seem to notice him standing there in the corner. He was pulling on his hat and coat. He was clearly going somewhere, and in a mighty hurry too. Mrs Ferguson, he was saying, I want your class to stop whatever it is they're doing right now. I want them to get their coats on and assemble at once in the playground. And hurry, please. Why? What's going on? Mrs Ferguson asked. Is this a fire drill? No, no, nothing like that. You're not going to believe this, Mr Jenner said, but apparently there's a huge great whale in the river, right here, right now, just down the road from us. It's true. Now let's look at some of your amazing work that you sent through to us on Class Dojo. See if you can spot anything that's yours. Remember, you don't need to print off all the PowerPoint each week to complete all your work. Look at these excellent examples of the work, where children have chosen how to present their own work and chosen their own style. this week's DT lesson keep an eye out in next week's home learning PowerPoint for the next installment involving looking at different shaped columns and conducting a fair test to discover which is the strongest design. Keep sending your work in through Class Dojo I know we all love seeing all your amazing hard work that you're doing at home and your work then could feature in next week's video. That's all from me for now keep safe everyone bye bye